think so. Grab your Bibles with me if you would and go to Revelation chapter 5. I don't know why you're so excited about that. I thought that if we were going to begin the week in the throne room from Isaiah's perspective, then we might as well, if we're going to begin that way, we might as well end the week in the throne room from John's perspective. And so Revelation chapter 5, this is as deadly a text as you're going to find. It's, it's as dangerous a text as, as you're going to find. It's, it's one of those where, <laughs> where your life was heading in one direction and you read it and now your life is headed in a different one. That, that, that's, that's what this one can do. Revelation chapter 5. I wonder if we could do kind of a Baptist thing and stand together out of respect for God's word and to remind ourselves of who it is that we are dealing with here. Revelation chapter 5, I'll read out loud, you'll read along with me. We'll pray for God's help and then we're going to get to work. Revelation 5 verse 1, then I saw... In the right hand of him who was seated on the throne, a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep. To weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign upon the earth. Then I looked... And I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said amen and the elders fell down and worshiped. Father, we praise you for your word. We thank you for your son. We thank you that he alone is worthy. We thank you that he alone is the lamb who has been slain, who who is standing up. God, we thank you that your word is powerful. And Father, we ask now that you would step into this room through your spirit, by your word, and that you would flex a bit. And that you would show us yourself. And that we would be unable to leave here the same way as when we came in. 
God, that the, the, that the very trajectory and plans that we had for our lives coming in here might be different for having encountered you in this way. God, do that for your glory. Do it for the fame of the name of your Son. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Now, I want to encourage you on your own time to go back and read Revelation 1-4 to to this point. What you have going on here is you have John, at the, toward the end of his life, exiled to an island called Patmos. And while he's out on the island, God comes and says, John, I'm going to take you up to heaven. I'm going to show you some stuff. I want you to write down what you see. And so this is John, like this is John the Apostle who wrote the book of John, who wrote 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. This is the disciple whom Jesus loved, and, and he is given this vision into the throne room of heaven. And so he is essentially writing it down as he sees it. So, so in real time, he's writing it down. Chapter 5, verse 1, then I saw... In the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. Now, if you go back and read chapter 4, you realize that the him who is seated on the throne is God the Father. He has been praised uh, as creator in chapter 4. And now John's vision through the throne room of heaven continues moving. And so you have a picture here of... God the Father seated upon the throne and, and he has in his right hand a scroll. And this is an interesting scroll. It's written on the inside and on the outside. Now, in, in Roman culture, you, you would have had these scrolls. They would have been sealed with multiple seals. Um, probably never seven. At least I never found an example of seven in my reading, but, but with three. And, and you could have, sometimes the scroll would only have writing on the inside, or sometimes it'd have writing on the inside and kind of a summary on the outside. Well, you know, we see here that, that this scroll is written on the inside and on the outside, and it's sealed with seven seals. Verse 2, and I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to break its seals? So you have to get the picture. Here's God on the throne in, in heaven, and in his right hand is a scroll. It is a large scroll, writing on the, on the inside, writing on the outside, seven seals running down it. Now, you have to figure out what is the scroll actually, what, what is it? And, and I think broadly, you could say that the scroll is, is God's plan for the world. It would be like God's um, eternal plan for the world. But I think you could get more specific than that, and, and I think the text bears this out. This is, the, the, the scroll is, is God's plan of redemption for his people. It's kind of like the playbook of how God is going to get this thing done. Not only how he's going to get it done, but who um, in particular is going to be able to pull it off. And so, so here's God sitting on the throne, scroll in his right hand. Um, John's having this vision in real time. And, and all of a sudden, here comes a mighty angel, a strong angel. Now, I don't know what you think of when you think of angels, but think of a strong one. Like, this isn't the little guy, you know, the little naked baby with wings and a bow, um, you know, for Valentine's. That's not who this guy is. Th th this, this angel, he shows up, you kind of stand up a little straighter. You know, this angel looks like he could wreck some fools, and he steps up, kind of takes center stage, and poses a very, very interesting question. The question goes like this. With a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to break its seals? Who's worthy to open the scroll and read the plan? Who's worthy to open the scroll, read the plan, and pull it off? Who has the wisdom and the capability to look into the eternal purposes of God for the redemption of wayward and rebellious sinners? Who can look into that eternal plan and who can read it and who can go execute it? Who can go pull that one off? Who's worthy to open the scroll? Verse 3. And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth. There ain't no angels in heaven. There's no, there's no human beings on earth. There's no human beings under the earth. Those in redemptive history past, no one is able to open the scroll. And John says, 
And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. Now, can you just feel the hopelessness there for a second? Here you are, taken up into this vision of the heavens. Here you are, God on the throne. In his right hand is this scroll, and just by, by nature of who he is and the throne he sits on, he's important. By nature of who he is and the throne he sits on, whatever he has in his hand is important. John is, is kind of given a vision of what's happening here. This angel steps up, and in relation to this God and in relation to the scroll in his hand says, who can open this? And you'll notice the text moves a bit slow, doesn't it? Like, John's taking his time here. He could have summarized this in a hurry. He's taking his time. Who who can open this? No one in heaven or on earth or under the earth. And the, the hopelessness of that predicament overwhelms John. And he begins to weep loudly because no one is found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, came to John and said, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. So let's spend the rest of our time figuring this out and doing this. Number one, who is this lion of the tribe of Judah? Number two, what has he done? And number three, why did he do it? Number one, who is he? Well, we get some clues into this with with the answer from this elder um, that the, the, the lion of the tribe of Judah. So I know you probably read this this morning and know where I'm going with this. In Genesis 49, Jacob is giving blessings to his 12 sons. He's about to die. And he's, he's speaking a blessing over his 12 sons who eventually become the 12 tribes of Judah. Or I'm sorry, the, the, the 12 tribes of Israel. One of those sons' name is Judah, and as Jacob comes to Judah, he says to him, I'm going to paraphrase, you're you're a bit like a lion, and and you you will get ticked off on occasion and go wreck some fools. And, and you are going to be a ruler. There is a scepter of power and, and rulership that will never, ever leave you. That's like Genesis 49, 8 to 10. I paraphrased it in, in the Alex version. You can go read it. But, but so, so you have, on the one hand, you have this lion of the tribe of Judah. So that's a prophecy that whoever this is is coming through the line of Judah, through the tribe of Judah. So, so that's the one hand. He's of the line of the tribe of Judah, comma, the root of David. Now, I believe it's 2 Samuel chapter 7, where where God makes a promise to David, or a covenant with David, where he says, someone will come after you who will sit on your throne forever. There will be a king come through the line of David who will rule and reign forever. So, So are you hearing that? On the one hand... From from Jacob to his son Judah, who becomes a tribe in in Israel, through the line of Judah, that there's going to be this lion-esque like figure who will rule and who will reign. And through the the, the line of David, there there will come one, a king, who's like David, only better than David, who's who's like David, only there won't be any Bathsheba, who's like David, only only there won't be any um, rest and confidence in his own strength, who's who's like David. David in that he can he can walk up to Goliath, um, smack him in the head with a rock, and then take his own dang sword, cut his head off, and hold it up and be like, so much for that guy. That there's gonna be a king who's gonna be a giant killer like David, only only he will have all of David's strengths and none of his weaknesses. And in that one, that one is the one who is able, who is capable, who is worthy to open the scroll. That one. Coming through the line of Judah, through the, king, through the kingly lineage of David, that one. And he already has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. Verse 6. And between the throne and the four living creatures, 
and among the elders. In other words, he's in the background, not the foreground. Do you understand? Right now, I'm in the foreground. I'm up front. I can back up in here and get way back in here a bit, and I'm in the background. I'll still be back there, but I'm back there a ways. Well, well, John's attention has been peaked here because this lion of the tribe of Judah, this root of David, he already has conquered. He's worthy. John's looking for him. And right now, what he sees is a bit in the background. But back there, in between all of that, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns, that means infinite power, seven eyes, that would be infinite knowledge, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth, seven spirits there. Here's my take on that. It's the Holy Spirit. So, so here's this lamb. Now, now if you remember, and, and I do, I thought I was looking for a lion. Did you? That's who I thought we were looking for. I thought we were looking for a lion. I, I, I imagined, you know, some, you know, and I looked back and in between all of that, there's, a, there's just a beastly looking lion standing back there ready to wreck some fools. That's who I thought we were looking for. That's who you thought we were looking for too. That's who John thought we were looking for. And he looks back in there and he's like, wait a second, is, is that right? Because there's a lamb back there. And lambs normally don't wreck fools. I mean, I, right? Like, but, but in the infinite plan of God, in the infinite wise plan of God, the one who would come through the tribe of Judah and the one who would sit on the throne of the king, of, of, of the kingly line of David would not maul its prey like a lion. But rather, he would be consumed by death itself like a lamb. And as Augustine said, only to then turn on death and devour it like a lion. Who is this lamb? None other than the slain Son of God, Jesus Christ, risen from the dead three days later. He is a lamb who appears as though he has been slain, but make no mistake about it, he's standing up because he had died, but he's not dead anymore. And so here is this lamb standing up as though he had been slain. That lamb is Jesus Christ. What has he done? Let's keep reading. Verse 7, and he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders, I think those are angels, you can go study that out. And the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying... Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For or because. Here's why you're worthy. Jesus, here's, here's why you're worthy to walk up to God the Father, to reach to his right hand, to grab the scroll, to crack the seals, and to open it up. Here's why you're worthy. Because, because you were slain. And by implication, you've, you are not slain anymore. For you were slain, and by your blood, you ransomed. You, you bought back. That's what ransom means. You rescued out of slavery to bondage, to sin, and death, and hell, and the devil. You ransomed people for God from every tribe, and language, and people, and nation. So here's why you're worthy. Because in God's infinite wisdom, you would not come down like David and, and wreck all your enemies with the sword. You would not maul your prey like a lion as was prophesied. You would do that to death, but you would do it through death. John Owen said it really well. Jesus Christ killed death 
when he died and rose. This is the sort of warfare that God planned from eternity past for his son to do. He would be consumed by death only to turn around and to destroy it. And he is worthy because through that death, he has ransomed a people for God from every tribe, language, people, and nation. And he has made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. So you know what that's talking, you know what that's referring to? It's referring to the church. It is the church who has been a ransomed people from every nation, tribe, tongue, language, people. Every skin color represented in heaven. Every language represented in heaven. All of them. This is a, this is a global plan of redemption. This is not a, a bloodline. This isn't, this isn't the line of Israel. This isn't the line of David. The, the Messiah will come through that line. But this, this singular Messiah coming through a singular bloodline will ransom a global people. That's what he's done. He's ransomed a global people for himself and made them a kingdom and priest to our God and they will reign upon the earth. Now, do you remember, perhaps, what God told Adam and Eve to do on the earth in the, in the Garden of Eden? He essentially told them reign upon the earth. He essentially told them rule over the earth. He essentially told them represent me here and, and, and exercise authority as my viceroys on the earth. And you know what they did? Mess the whole thing up. And you know what Jesus means to do in the infinite plan of God unrolling in the scroll? What he means to do is to bring us back to the Garden of Eden only better and set the church up in the position that Adam and Eve were originally where we will walk with God and rule and reign upon the earth again. That this is God's infinite plan. This is what Jesus Christ has done. This is what the Lamb who is Jesus has done. He has ransomed a people for himself. So that's who is he. That's what has he done. Finally, we'll keep reading, looking for the question of why did he do it. Why did he do it? Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Why did he do it? For his glory. For his glory. Why is that important that you understand that? Because it is quite easily, uh, it, is, it is an easy pit to fall into when you read the Bible that you see all that God has done, all of the lengths, all of the great lengths that he has gone to to redeem you, and you can very easily conclude, I'm awesome. You can very easily conclude, I'm the center of God's affections. You can very easily conclude um, that, that, it's, that it's all aimed at you. Now, the problem with that is actually the Bible, because the Bible makes clear, once you read all of it, once you keep reading, once you think about it, it makes clear that, no, actually, you're not awesome. He is. You're not worthy. He is. The, the, the myriad, like, are you tracking with the text? The, the, the numberless number of angels, myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands of angels who fall on their faces and sing worthy is the lamb are singing worthy is the lamb because Jesus Christ alone is worthy of worship. He's not going to share it with you. The point of the Bible is not you're awesome. The point of the gospel is not you're awesome. The point of the cross is not you're awesome. The point of the cross in the gospel, in the Bible, in the entire universe is to point all of our eyes to the fact that he alone is awesome. And it will be your great joy if you are in Christ to celebrate his awesomeness for all of eternity in a place called heaven as you rule and reign upon the earth as he calls you to do. I pointed it out. I'll say it one more time. I could have written this chapter in about five words. I was in heaven one time. Okay, I'm already passed, but 
I was in heaven once, and there was a scroll, and no one could open it. The end. Except for it wasn't the end, because then a guy opened it, and it was Jesus, and everybody said, he's awesome. The end. But John is not interested in that. Like, like John is going to great lengths. It almost seems to like slow the thing down. Why do you think he's doing that? Can I tell you what I think? I think he's doing it because he wants you to stop for a second. He just wants you to stop for a second. He wants you to kind of climb inside of the text. He wants you to get yourself there. He wants you to look at the holiness of God seated on the throne with a scroll in his hand that is his eternal purpose for his people. He wants you to feel the emptiness down in your soul like an emptiness that you have never felt at the prospect of the fact that God could write the plan up and yet no one be worthy to execute the plan. He wants you to think about the hollowness of heaven and the fact that there is no one there worthy to open the scroll. He wants you to think about the inability of humanity to open the scroll. No one down here. No one that's gone before. No one is able. He wants you to just sink down into the depths of despair for a moment at the prospect of the fact that God could let this thing roll out all the while letting us strive and climb and look and long to be ransomed, to be purchased, to be set free from the things that we cannot be free from. He wants us to think for a second about somewhere in the background a lamb standing up in the throne room of heaven who looks like he's died but is not dead anymore because he is in fact standing. He wants us to see the lamb come from the background up to the foreground. He wants us to picture him, the risen king, grab the scroll and open its seals. And he wants our souls to feel the praise of heaven as myriads and myriads of angels cry out at the top of their lungs at his worthiness. Because he was willing to leave heaven and come to earth. He was willing to become a lamb when by rights he's a lion. He was willing to humble himself and take on a, a flesh more than that, to take on your sin and my sin while all of his life resisting sin and conquering sin and overcoming it. He wants us to see that in the lineage of King David, there is a giant killer, but it will not be Goliath this time. No, in fact, it appears as though the giant of death will kill him, only to have him three days later come back out with death's head in his hand and say, it is finished. And he wants us to join in with the choir of heaven in recognizing his worthiness. Who is he? Who is this lamb? Jesus Christ. What has he done? Ransom the people for himself. Why did he do it? For his own glory. For the fame of his own name. So what should we do? What should we do? Number one, the first thing that we should do is we should lay down our lives. Lay down our lives. Here's what I mean by that. That if you have not yet trusted in this lamb who was slain, who was slain in order to purchase you and release you and ransom you and buy you out of slavery, that you should lay down your life for him tonight. That you should declare him as your king. That you should see him as your only hope of getting out of slavery. That you should see him as your only hope of getting you out of bondage to sin and of getting bondage to sin out of you. That you should see him as your only hope and gladly fling yourself at him and say, Jesus, there is salvation in nowhere else. You alone are worthy. You alone are the only one capable to save my soul, to hold me and to keep me. I lay down my life to you. Now, I point that out because there's a bunch of you in this room who have not yet done that. We should lay down our lives in salvation. We should cry out to him for salvation. 
But we should also lay down our lives in sacrifice. If you are one of His, if you are one of His, you ought to behold His worthiness, to behold His beauty, and you ought to lay down your life in sacrifice to Him. You ought to say to Him, as the Apostle Paul said, Acts 20, 24, I don't count my life of any value nor as precious to myself. My life is yours, God. You should see that you are bought by blood. You should see that you are not your own. And you should gladly lay down your life for him. But I need you to see something deep down in here that perhaps may not rise to the surface unless it's pointed out. This is what I need you to see. The, the, the end of the story... You can keep reading Revelation, but I'll just summarize it for you. The end of the story is that those people who have been ransomed, they rally around the throne of the king after he has destroyed all enemies. He, he destroys all enemies. He flings them into the, the depths of hell where they will never get out. And, and, and that's what he does to all of his enemies. The end of the story is a people... Actually, from every nation, tribe, tongue, and language who are gathered around the throne, who are singing worthy to the land. That's how the story ends. Now listen to me. It does not appear right now, as you look around this world, like that's how the story ends. Am I correct on that? Like it doesn't appear that way. It certainly didn't appear that way as, as God is, through Jesus Christ, birthing a, a church in the midst of a Roman Empire that is hell-bent on extinguishing that church. As we said earlier, it's like, it's like walking out into a hurricane with a candle. And in that, it doesn't look like it's going to happen. It doesn't look like this thing's going to work. Except for Peter starts preaching and 3,000 people come to faith. And then 5,000 after that. And then, and then after that, that, that opponent, Paul, becomes, um, well, Saul becomes Paul and, and gets saved. And now he starts preaching and more people. And now there's a church here and there's a church there. And now there's another one over here and another one over there. And now this guy got on a boat and went over there. And they were going to kill him, but they didn't. Actually, they did later, but, but, but a few of them believed before they killed him, and in fact, when they killed him, it just made the gospel go brighter and, and burn longer, and now the gospel's taking ground over here and, and over there and over there, and that church there planted three more churches and planted more churches, and pretty soon, from a group of 11 dudes scared in a room with the door locked from the inside, and by the way, there's 11 of them because one of them betrayed him, from that, here we are, a global movement, a global movement of people redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And it's not over yet. As much ground as we have taken, it's not over yet. Because there are still places where the name of Jesus Christ has not been heard. And here's my whole point to you. My whole point to you is, is that it is God and God alone who is going to see to the redemption of his people from every nation, tribe, tongue, and language. God's going to do that. Do you know that when Jesus um, lays out the Great Commission, here, when, when we talk about the Great Commission, this is what we say. Go into all the nations, preach the gospel. Great, that's good. But don't forget the words Jesus said before that. Do you know what words he said before that? All authority has been given to me. All of it. I have all of it. I have all of it. I am in charge now. I have just defeated death. I have just put the devil to open shame. I have all authority. I am going to get this done. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use you 11 morons to, to get it done. And you 11 are pretty quickly going to turn into 3,000 and then 8,000 and then 10,000 and then 100,000 and then 100 million. And as it's happening, Rome is going to come along and try to extinguish you. And they're going to slaughter you like sheep. And your blood is going to run in the streets. And they're going to throw you to lions. And they're going to do all of that. And my gospel will not stop in all of that because my plan that I wrote down on a scroll a really long time ago, my plan that I wrote down before I even created the world, my plan will be accomplished because my son is sufficient for the task. So here's what that means. What that means is, is that it would be quite appropriate for a senior in high school in here who's got a great five-year plan for their lives 
heading off to college, going to med school, whatever else. It would be perfectly appropriate for that 18-year-old in here to say, forget that plan. I'm going to the nations. Forget that plan. I'm going to a people who has not yet heard the name of Jesus because the Bible that I'm reading says that people will hear his name, will bow their knees, will be redeemed by him, and will be one day represented in the kingdom of God. Forget med school. I'm going to the nations. And it would be perfectly appropriate and quite logical for you to do that. Do you know why? Because God promised that he's going to get it done. And he offers you and I a part to play in this. Do you understand that? Do you know how freeing that is? And it's not your job to go save anybody. You don't need to go save the nations. In fact, if you think you do, stay home. Your view of God is way too small. Your view of yourself is way too big. You don't need to go save anybody. God is the one who saves. You go as a vessel with a mouth like John the Baptist. I just have a voice. I'm just a voice out here in the wilderness proclaiming the excellencies of Jesus Christ. You just preach the gospel. Let God do the saving. And if they kill you, they kill you. So we lay down our lives in sacrifice. To him, confidently. <laughs> Guys, I don't know if you're hearing me. I pray that you are. I'm not even asking for all of you. Like three of you. Three of you. For there to be another Adoniram Judson in the room. Go to Burma. Bury two wives and five kids in taking the gospel to a place that's never heard it before vomits himself to death, dies of dysentery. Some of his last words, how few there are who die so hard, struggles with bouts of depression, digs his own grave, laying in a jungle, out in the jungle. After he buries, I think it was his second or third kid and his wife Sarah right before then. Lay, laying in his own grave, wishing that he was dead, wondering, God, where are you? And here comes a dude out of the bushes, wakes him up and says, are you the man telling people about Jesus Christ? Because I want to know about him. Hardly sees anyone come to faith. Do you know how strong there is a gospel presence in Burma right now? It's in the millions. Because of one man who, who literally paid it all, hardly saw any fruit of anything, he dies and God blows the place up after he's dead. Here's a question. Do you pity Adoniram Judson? Do you pity him? Do, 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 you, do you wonder if he wonders if it was worth it? Certainly there were times as he's put another kid in the ground that he's going, man, is it worth it? But one millisecond into glory, one millisecond into beholding the glory of the Lamb, he's not wondering if it was worth it anymore. He's recognizing that God's plan was to redeem a people and Adoniram Judson got to play a part in it. Is there an Adoniram Judson? I don't know. But I do catch myself wondering at times as I look across the landscape of this generation, where are the young men and women who will count the cost and go confidently because this lamb who has been slain is not dead anymore and he is the one who executes the plan. I catch myself wondering about this. Part of the reason I'm here, driving here, Lord, where's the next one? Where's the next one who's going to go to the nations? Where's the next one who will count the cost? Where's the next one who will say, I will pay and pay some more so that lost men and women can hear the gospel and go confidently? Where are they? So, we look at the lamb. We lay down our lives, number one. Number two, and I'm done. Not only do we lay down our lives, but listen to me, we lift up our voices. You're like, I didn't see that one coming. Yeah. You know what's strange about Christians? We've always been a singing people. You know what's even stranger than that? We're singing about a God we've never seen before. You know what's even stranger than that? 
We're singing about a God we've never seen before with a bunch of people we'll probably never see again this side of things. You know what's not strange about that? That we're singing about a God we've never seen before with a bunch of people we'll not see again this side of heaven. And the reason that is strange but not so strange is because when you look at what this lamb of ours has done, when you see what he has done, I don't know how else you respond other than through song. Do you know that they have thrown us to lions and we've gone there singing? Do you know that they've burned us at the stake and we've sung until the fires lapped at our throats and the Lord pulled us out? Do you know that we have always been a singing people in the good days and the bad? And do you know that God means for us to continue to be a singing people? As that is such a fitting response for us to lift our voices and lay down our lives. And do you know that my prayer for you is that you would be a young man or a young woman who, is a, who has a song on your lips? A song on your lips of praise to Jesus. Words on your lips of praise to Jesus. That you'd go to your school and to your church and to your college and there would be a song on your lips and it would be Christ. And that you would find yourself singing in your last breath only to awaken in heaven and be singing all the more. We've always been a singing people. And it is the most fitting thing that we can do when we look at this great lamb. It is the most fitting thing that we can do because what it is, give me two more minutes, what it is, is it is called practice for heaven. It's called practice for heaven. You don't think about heaven very often, I don't think. Because life has not yet probably gotten hard enough for most of you to cause you to think about it. You've probably not lost enough yet to begin thinking about it. But I wish you would. And I wish that you would begin thinking that moments like these, what, like what we're about to do, which is we've heard the word and now we're about to respond in song. I pray that moments like these would become more normative in your life, more regular in your life, so that, so that you could get off the bus, as it were, at the gates of heaven, have your jersey on, have the song on your lips, and be ready to roll. You were down here, you sung your way through dark, dark nights, deep water, loss, sorrow. You magnified the name of Jesus as you preached the gospel. And you get to heaven and you get there finally. And the song just keeps on playing. So let's sing our way there. Let's sacrifice our way there. Let's you and I count the cost. Let's you and I go confidently. Let's you and I live the kind of lives that will have more people from that nation, tribe, tongue, and language, that will have more of them. Maybe it's the kid with the locker next door to you. Maybe it's somebody from a people group you've not even heard of yet. More people gathered around that throne because you and I live the lives that we lived for his glory. Father, would you help us to that end? God, in this moment, I'm, I'm just, God, I'm supremely confident because of your word, not because of my preaching, that you can do something here. God, I'm supremely confident that one or two or even three or maybe even 12 or maybe even more than that would be willing to lay down their lives and lift up their voices. That would be willing to surrender their plans for your plan. That, would, that God would be able this evening to get a glimpse of this great king and this great slain lamb. And God, for having caught a glimpse of him, will never ever be the same again. God, would you cause that to happen for your glory? We pray these things in your name.